Who's excited to be here this morning? Yeah? So this is our last week in the Beatitude series. We are jumping in to the, to the final Beatitude, and that is blessed are those who are persecuted. Doesn't sound too fun, does it? But we are going to unpack this one today. It's going to be really, really good. Um, I want you to real quick turn with me to your Bibles, Matthew 5, and we're going to start with 2 through 9, and we're actually going to jump in today. we got a, a lot to unpack on this one, and I'm really, really uh, been looking forward to this message. As I sat with the Lord more and more about it, He just really began to reveal some things that I was like, man, this makes, this makes so much sense. But we have been talking about these Beatitudes as core values. They are the core values of the kingdom. They are the core values of what Jesus is looking for in us as his followers. And so I want to pick up, and, I, and since we've been going week by week, I want to start, and let's read through all of them, and then we'll wrap up here where we are today. So let's start in Matthew 5, 2 through 9. Two through nine. Here we go. And Jesus opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And here we go with today's last one. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Holy Spirit, for the next few moments, I just pray that you would move swiftly and powerfully through your word. I pray that you would get me completely out of the way and that your word would just hit all of our hearts, that it would open our eyes, that it would absorb, we would absorb your truth today and that you would release your freedom, your love, your acceptance in this place. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen? amen? All right. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, as we know, persecution can come in many forms, many different, different ways. Some of the ways that persecution can come, obviously we know that there's physical persecution, against the church, church history, the Bible. Even believers today experience that in other parts of the world. Um, that's becoming more increasingly here in America. I think we would all agree to that. There, there is a heightened sense of attack and persecution against Christianity, for sure. But it can come in all, all types of forms. I've learned that persecution can come in an accusation. There could be a false accusation made against you something that is falsely accused about you. You're innocent, you didn't do anything, but it's falsely accused against you. That's a form of persecution. Judgment, there could be a judgment towards you, against you. That's another form, slander, defaming character, name calling, right? All of these are forms, different types of persecution, degrading even. And I mean, the list can go on and on. But as I sat with this and actually really begin to unpack, what, what is, if I could find a word, that, that, that encompasses all of those things in one word that you and I always go through and walk through and what Jesus is speaking to us here, I found that word, and I want to share that word today. You know what that word is? It's rejection. It's rejection. Everyone in this room at some point or at some level has experienced rejection, right? Some of us have been rejected by our parents, some of us have experienced rejection through friends, maybe close friends, right? Doesn't that hurt? There's a pain that comes with rejection. Some of us experience rejection in school. Maybe not getting into the school we wanted to get into. Maybe not getting the job that we wanted to. Who has ever had a letter in their life that starts out like this? We regret to inform you, <laughs> right? And when you read that letter, you don't even have to read everything else because you just know, oh, that just got shut down, right? So at some point, some level, we all experience rejection. We go through life's rejections. And what Jesus is pointing to us in this beatitude, though, is really amazing because he's saying, listen, 
Not only do we will go through life's rejections, but when we actually follow Jesus, when we choose to follow him, there's a spiritual element of rejection that comes in. So rejection can have all kinds of effects on our lives. It can have psychological effects, can have a spiritual effect. It definitely has an emotional effect, right? So it's very important on how we handle rejection. How do you process rejection. You know, Amber and I, obviously, you know, we have four daughters and one son and having a a household with so many kids, um, never knew (laughs) that sometimes we would face little points of rejection in life. Maybe somebody in here that has multiple kids or a lot of kids can understand what I'm saying. When we when all our kids were small, because they're all close apart, I mean, you know, we had a ton of kids at the grocery store hanging in the carts. You know, they were all close to age, you had five of them. And we would get these comments. We would get those rolls of the eyes. We would almost like, like, man, you got a lot of kids. Like, what are you doing? Like, literally, you know, one of the, one of the most common ones I always hear? Boy, I bet your hands are full. Has anybody ever heard that? Boy, I bet you got your hands full. Or we would hear stuff like, man, I'll be praying for you. Gosh, that looks rough. That's going to be rough. You know, you, I can hear all these comments. I tell you what, Amber, one time it was, it, was, it was tough. I wasn't with her, but she went to a store. Was that in North Carolina? Costco in North Carolina? She went to a Costco with all the kids one day when they were real small. And this gentleman walks up to her and just looks at her. Just with this dumbfounded look. And he's like, And you know what he says to her? What are you trying to prove? Like, I never thought having kids would be such a magnet for rejection. But it's something we had to experience. It's something that we had to encounter. But the whole point is this. Listen, we all encounter it, but the Lord wants us to be able to handle it properly and to process it well. So I want to unpack that today. What does it look like to process rejection? In fact, have you even asked yourself that question? Have you ever stopped to pause and ask yourself, how do you handle rejection? How do you process it? Like, what do you do? What's your response? Is it anger? Is it lashing out? Or is it hiding or just kind of not dealing with it? Have you ever considered how you, uh, how you observe in your own life how you handle rejection? Because here's what I love about this final beatitude. Are you ready? Even though blessed are those who are persecuted, it's the next verse, verse 11. It's the only beatitude. It's the only beatitude that Jesus gives commentary on. Verse 11 is commentary to the last beatitude. And listen to what it says. Let's read it together. Matthew 5, 11. You got that? Here we go. Blessed are you when others revile you or insult you, would be another word, and persecute persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Here we go. Verse 12. But rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. How many know that it's kind of hard to rejoice and be glad? It's kind of hard for that man in Costco to hear that comment and to me to rejoice and be glad. But the Lord is saying something. He's saying, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven as they persecuted the prophets who were before you also. And I want you you to catch that. And I want to draw to our attention that the main focus on this beatitude, the main point is not the persecution. The main point is not us getting insulted, having people speak badly about us and going through all of types of rejection in life. That's not the main point. The main point that Jesus wants to drive home is our response. Be rejoiceful and happy when these things happen to you. So in other words, the Lord is saying, listen, blessed and happy is the person who understands how to process rejection well. Blessed and happy are those who actually can take rejection and not let it destroy them, but they could actually grow from it, right? And this is what Jesus is is leading us to. And so rejection, you know, depends on how you process it, depends on how you handle it. I mean, it can leave you feeling defeated, discouraged, depressed, or it could actually strengthen you. What if I told you that rejection can actually strengthen you, help you, build you up, cause you to get stronger, right? That's what the Lord is leading us to understand. So this beatitude is basically showing us those two things. 
A, there's going to come a level of persecution when we walk with the Lord, no doubt. There's going to be a level of rejection that we're all going to have to face. But here's the second thing. But he's also saying, based on how we handle that rejection, it will determine, are we going to be stopped in our journey with Jesus or are we going to be strengthened in our journey with Jesus? So I did a little research, a little study would, would, would unveil this. And I wanted to know, what are some of the top ways people handle rejection? What are some of the top ways that people process rejection? And there's four that I saw that I felt like, wow, I could see this being like a top four list. And I want to mention them because I think they're worth noting. The first one is this, rumination. 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 What is rumination? That's playing it over and over in your mind. So when you're rejected in some level, some form, you just keep playing that over and over and over in your mind, like a record, like repeat on the queue on Spotify. Like it just keeps replaying over and over and over. And when you're replaying it, you're focusing on all the negative emotion, all the negative feeling. You're focusing all on the negative part on it. And you get lost in that cycle. What if this would have happened? What if I did this? What if that didn't happen? What if I didn't go there? Has anybody ever been there? Right? You ruminate. It's one of the ways people handle rejection. They, they ruminate. Second way is comparison. Comparison. We compare our rejection experiences with someone else's, particularly those who are close to us. And so we may experience rejection in many ways. And what we'll tend to do if we compare, what we'll do is we'll begin to compare the next person's experiences and go, gee, why weren't they rejected? Or why didn't they experience that? It'd be like, let's say you're next to someone, you're doing life with someone, and it's obvious the favor of God's on their life. Like everything they touch, doors open. <laughs> everything they do, it's just like, whoo, the angels are singing, the red carpet's rolled out, and you're like, what in the world? Meanwhile, you've been fasting and praying. You've been in the wilderness. You've kept your feet from going down wrong paths. You know you've done everything right, but it seems like every door is shut, and everything you touch turns to nothing. Isn't it easy sometimes to feel that and begin to compare our experience to other people and then go, Lord, why? Like, what's going on? So some of us grab to comparison when we're rejected. It's a, a response. A third one is downplaying feelings. Downplaying feelings. So some of us won't even process the emotion or the feeling itself, and we'll just downplay it. Oh, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that big of a deal when really it was. When really it was really brought, could bring a lot of hurt in your life right? And so we just downplay it, stuff it, don't deal with it, we're going to move on. Fourth one is self-blame. Self-blame. Anybody ever done this one? It's believing that you're the sole reason for the rejection. It is your problem. It is your fault. Everything has to do with you. But the reality is that may not be true. There may be other factors involved. There may be other people involved that are equally responsible. But there's a tendency for us to take all the blame and to take all of, the, all of that focus on us. And so I just want to give us some context here that these are some ways that we process rejection. Now, you may be looking at that list and go, I can resonate with that one. You may be looking at the list and go, I resonate with all of them because I've done it at some point or another. I think I've done all four of them at some point or another, but I want to I want to bring good news to us this morning, and I really want to encourage you, encourage you, encourage us that the Bible actually offers us healthy ways to process rejection, healthy ways to actually handle when we are rejected, that are better than these ways. They actually are so much better, right? And so I want to encourage you with that today because this is what I've learned. This is an amazing truth, and that is. Rejection, now this is Michael Thornton's paraphrase words. Rejection in God's kingdom, in the kingdom, is a way for promotion. Rejection, what if I told you rejection is a way that God actually promotes us, that actually propels us? And what do I mean by promotion? I mean that what if I told you that when we are rejected and we experience rejected, then every rejection, there's an opportunity to draw closer to the Father. There's an opportunity to draw closer to Jesus. There's an opportunity to draw closer and to be in union with the Holy Spirit. We experience him and his presence in ways that, that normally we couldn't experience. 
And when we begin to see rejection from this lens, when we see that when we are rejected from this perspective, what it begins to do is Christ begins to form in us. Like he takes root in us. He becomes stronger within us because we're not so quick to ruminate or we're not so quick to self-blame, but we're actually taking a moment to pause and to invite Jesus into the rejection to actually process it with him so that he can begin to heal our hearts. And so what I've learned is that when we handle rejection in the proper way, it does two things. It satisfies the desires in our hearts and it brings us peace and contentment. And the other thing it does, it actually opens up doors for advancement. It actually opened up doors in our life for favor, for blessing, financial blessing, relational provision. Like it literally, it literally accelerates God's plan for our lives, right? This is the heartbeat behind what Jesus is teaching. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. Blessed are you when you're rejected. Blessed are you when you are talked about, insulted. If you can handle that, if you can process that well, that'll actually turn to a reward in your life. It'll be rewarded. Man, I don't know about you guys, but I think that's good news. Can I put it this way? This is what the Lord is saying in this. Blessed and happy is the person who was not only rejected because of their love for me, but happy is the person who sees a rejection as a way to draw closer to me. Blessed and happy is the person who is able to process rejection as an opportunity to receive extraordinary blessings and rewards from my hand. To that person, I will give the whole of my kingdom. Right, that's the heartbeat. That's what the Lord is saying in this beatitude. So I want to unpack a few minutes left here. I want to unpack what are some healthy ways that we could actually process rejection and what the Bible points us towards. So let's start here. First one, are you ready? You can write this down. Jesus uses rejection in our life, in your life. He uses rejection to actually build our foundation in him. Jesus uses rejection as a way to build a foundation for him and in him to strengthen our faith. Let's go to 1 Peter 2, 4 through 7. I love this verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. And this is Peter writing to the church with a language about how we are living stones, right? All right, you can follow along with me. Peter says this, as you come to him, Jesus, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be holy, a priesthood, and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, oh man, this is so good. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone a cornerstone chosen and precious and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. All right, here we go. This is what the main verse I want to highlight for the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone that the builders, let that word sink in, rejected. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, I don't know if you know much about cornerstones, but historically, if we were to build buildings, the cornerstone, we have that picture, by the way, of the cornerstone. There's a cornerstone is this part of the building. It's the most important part of the building. Historically, a cornerstone holds the weight and the structure for the entire building to be built. And so if the cornerstone's removed, no matter how beautiful and big the structure is, it will collapse. It will fall apart. That's why Peter's saying Jesus is the cornerstone, right? He is the stone. But he's also saying that we are stones joined in together with him. And the stone builders rejected, and what the stone builders rejected had become the cornerstone. I actually have an illustration here. Now, this bag... This bag's heavy. May not look like it, but right now I'm struggling. This bag's really heavy. And this is what it's like when we don't handle and process rejection well. 
It's like a stone that gets in our bags and we carry it everywhere we go. And how many know when you carry a heavy bag like this, it's kind of hard to move, isn't it? It's kind of hard to go forward. You want to kind of just stand still, be stuck, even maybe go backwards because it's so heavy. But Peter is showing us a beautiful, beautiful illustration here because what he's saying, he's saying rejection is like a stone. And he said, but when you handle it properly, when you handle it rightly, he's basically saying these stones that are meant to hurt you through rejection, when you process it with Jesus, he takes those stones of rejection in our life and actually uses them to build a firm foundation in our life. The stone that was rejected became the cornerstone. In other words, Jesus was rejected, was he not? Yeah, I want you to catch this. This is so good. Jesus was rejected in so many ways, but Jesus took every rejection that he faced and he turned it into a foundational stone, into a memorial stone, into an Ebenezer, into a memorial, into a core memory that he would build his church on. Do you remember the woman caught in the act of adultery? And the Pharisees come over, and what are they going to do? And Jesus stops them. And look what Jesus does. He deals with their judgment and their pride. At the same time, the woman who's caught in adultery, he deals with her sin. And what the stone would say, judgment or pride, Jesus flips it, and the stone says, forgiveness. Yeah. Cop, isn't that, do you, are you guys catching that? Right? Right? Take, think about how many times you've been rejected in your life. Think about how many times you've caught it, even for standing up for God, and, and caught it for standing up for the Lord. There's a way when we process that rightly and correctly that God will take that experience and turn it, flip it into a memorial stone. And then it's no longer in our bag. And then it doesn't matter what stone is thrown at us. It now begins to build something for his glory and for his benefit, right? How about there was another story? Do you remember the story where Jesus is at the Pharisee's house and the sinful woman comes over and she's just so undone by the Lord? She was adulterous, the Bible says, really bad. Seven demons were in her and she's wiping her feet, uh, wiping Jesus' feet with her tears, crying over him. And at the same time, the Pharisee is, is looking at Jesus, correcting him. Do you know who's washing your feet right now? Do you know who's next to you? If you only knew this woman. And Jesus takes that accusation and he turns it into mercy. And what begins to happen in our life is that every time we experience rejection and we process it with the Lord, he takes those memories of it he takes those, those experiences of it and he flips them to be a anchor truth, a foundational stone for you in your faith to strengthen you so that when tougher times come, you won't be swayed because you're standing on a firm foundation. Man, guys, isn't that so good? Plus, your book bag gets lighter. Guys, I can't stress how important these stones are in our life. They're critical to our healing and our development in Jesus. How so? I want to connect it to a more modern term that we're using. And this is a modern term called core memories. Now, I don't know if you ever heard the term core memories, but I want to read a definition. I don't have it up here, but I felt this was a really good definition I found by a lady named Ariana Palmy, who was a health care professional. This is how she defines core memories. A core memory is a profoundly influential experience that shapes who we are and how we view the world. These memories are not just fleeting moments, but are foundational building blocks of our identity and our behavior. You see, unlike other memories, some memories just flee, flee away, they fade. Not these memories. These memories stick with you a lifetime. 
I can go back my, right now in my mind 20 years ago. I can take you to the day I walked into a drug rehab center and I literally met the Lord. That memory is formed in my life. It's, I, could, I could close my eyes and I'm there. It's that vivid. It's that clear. 20 years ago, it's that vivid, that's clear. Why? It's because all of that was turned into a foundational stone for me. And it has now become a core memory. It's become a core memory that has shaped my identity in Christ. It's become a core memory that has shaped who I am and my behavior all flows from that. And guys, that is good news. So what are you saying? I'm saying the stone that was rejected became the cornerstone. And when you process rejection with Jesus in your life, he takes those stones, he takes those hurts and those wounds, those insults and all of those things, he takes them and he turns them into beautiful experiences and memories. You see, Jesus has a fun, uh, 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 awesome way of actually extracting the pain out of the memory. He can actually take the pain out of the memory because it doesn't hurt anymore. That's how you know he's healed you. That's how you know you've processed it well and you didn't get stuck in the pain. Are you with me this morning? Gosh, I have so much to share on that, but I'll stop right here. I got to share this one quick story. Ooh, man, one of the most toughest times of rejection came to Amber and I is we were brought in specifically, we were brought in to be youth pastors at a church. And the senior pastor was a gung-ho for it. He actually called us, invited us. The board at the time was a full unanimous vote. They wanted us. But there was a certain leader on staff who was over the youth that did not want us there. <laughs> he wanted someone else there. Well, senior pastor didn't know that, nor did the elders. So that was all kind of fun. And we just kind of happened to be the pimple popper, if you will. We just kind of busted the whole thing up. And I'll never forget, uh, it almost was a war between this pastor and the senior pastor. And it just was very clear, this is not the timing, this is not going to work out. And so the senior pastor made this other pastor give us a phone call to tell us why. We, I mean, we hadn't even been there. It was unbelievable. And on the phone that day, I'll never forget what he said. And this is what he said. He goes, well, the reason why you're not getting the job here, the reason why... You're not going to be youth pastor here. It's because you just don't fit in here. Just don't fit in. Just don't fit in. You're too black and white. Your testimony's too extreme. You just don't fit in what we're trying to do here. That was the actual words. Got off the phone. Uh, rumination, self all of that stuff, anger. Looked at Amber. We're both broke up about it. And I, I, it hit me personally deep because I was like, well, dang, Lord, I don't fit in anywhere. Even when I did drugs for 10 years, I'd be in houses smoking crack, sniffing meth, hanging around with drug buddies in a trailer. And then in the middle of it, they go, why are you here? You, are you going to be like a preacher? You should, you'll probably be like a preacher. They always wanted to ask me about the end times. Yeah, I'd be in it. We'd be high three days in. Tell us about the end times. Tell us about Revelation. You're going to be a preacher one day. It's like, good Lord. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want God. I don't want to be a preacher. I want to do drugs. Yeah, all right. Like that's where my, my mind of frame of mind was then. Didn't fit in. And then when I got saved, I, I guess I became too radical. God, Mike's praying so loud. You can hear him all over the building. You know what to do. And so that was a constant reminder. Don't fit in anywhere. It's almost like the enemy used that thing so hard. And so it got to me, guys. And so I had to go for a walk. And I remember walking around our neighborhood that afternoon and I began to weep and I began to talk to the Lord. And this is, I just want to use this, not for about me, but as a process, as an illustration of how to process rejection healthily. I began to cry. I felt all of that pain and I began to tell Jesus, I don't fit in here. I don't fit in anywhere, you know, and I just began to talk to him. And I began to talk to him. And I found the more I was able to use my words to articulate how I felt from that experience, the more his presence began to be, I could feel his presence more and more aware. And after I was done, I gave him room and I kept walking, pacing around our neighborhood. And I, and I was determined inside of my heart, I'm not going to stop. I'm not, I don't want to go back into the house until I, I have to hear from you. Because this is like our whole career on the line, like our future. Like, I thought this is what you called us to do. If not, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
So I can't leave until you speak. And about the third lap around, he broke in. You know what he said? He said, Michael, I didn't call you to fit in. I call you to stand out. I called you to be set apart, not set aside. And that's for some of you here this morning. You're not called to fit in. Us as a church, we're not called to fit in. We're called to stand out, to be set apart. What are you saying? That was the rejection stone that came. You don't fit in. That's what it says on this stone right here. You don't fit in. But then over here it says, because you're set apart. And as I'm sharing that with you today, I have number love in my heart for that brother. But it became now a foundational block. So when I do encounter rejection again today, a.k.a. man, Costco, or whoever, I go back to my core memory. I go back to my building block. And I remember who I am, and I remember where I'm going. Does that make sense? Are you with me this morning? So again, Jesus uses rejection to strengthen and build our faith. Ooh, number two, second one. You ready? Let's go here. Jesus uses rejection for redirection. It's got a little rhyme to it, doesn't it? Jesus uses rejection for redirection. I've learned many times that rejection is God's way of protection. I want you to hear that. Rejection could actually be a way that God is protecting you. Let's look at Psalm 18, one through two. Love this Psalm. I love you, O Lord, my strength. Listen to what David says. You are my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What David began to realize and what he connects here for us is that he made the Lord his shield and his protection. He knew the Lord would protect him no matter what. And that's really important to know that God's protection is very, is very part of who he is towards us. But I also want to encourage us that protection isn't just limited here to let me shield you from an attack or let me shield you from the fiery darts of the enemy. But God's protection is also a way that, a way that he protects us is he redirects our life when a door closes. Anybody has said the statement or heard the statement where one door closes... Another one opens, right? There is something about the Lord that he's able to take our rejection and actually redirect, reroute our lives even into a better path and course than where we originally were headed. That is so good. So look at here, uh, example, Paul, Acts 16, verse six through 10. I love this story about Paul because Paul encountered this. When Paul was uh, on one of his mission, mission trips, look at what he says. And they went through the region of Phygyra and Galatia, having been forbidden, isn't that something? Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Like not only Paul is getting rejected, he's getting rejected by the Lord. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, I want you to hold that thought. Can we put up the Bible map? I want to show you on a map what this looks like. All right, can you see where it says, I don't know if you see it, it says Antioch down to the bottom right where the red line is. Paul starts his journey here when we're reading from Antioch. And this is what Paul wants to do. Paul wants to go to Asia. You see Asia and you see Ephesus in the bottom left. Paul wants to go, as soon as he gets up, he wants to dart to Ephesus. He wants to go into Asia. But what we just read, the spirit of Jesus forbid him for going and speaking the word in Asia. And that was pretty disheartening, I bet, for Paul. Have you ever had something in your life where you know God was leading you? You even had a word for it, and you start heading into that direction only to find the door closed or only to find it to be a dead end? And you're like, what is going on? This is where you called me. This is where you led me. Paul is in this same moment. And so when he gets to this spot, 
Jesus forbids him, and he actually reroutes him to where? Macedonia. And when you read the story, a woman and her family get saved in Macedonia, and then Paul goes into jail, and that's when the earthquake happens, and the, the jailer, the Roman house, they all get saved from that. But here's the awesome thing about it, because Paul really wanted to go to Ephesus. But the Lord said, not time yet, Paul. So let's read this last verse, Acts 19, 11 and 12. When Paul finally gets to Asia in the back door, he actually goes all the way around to get to Ephesus. This is what happens when Paul gets to Ephesus. And God was doing, look at that. I mean, it's something if the Lord's doing miracles through your life, but extraordinary miracles. At the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. We read that a, the greatest revival in the New Testament happened in Ephesus. You go on to read that story. They actually bring all the scrolls and the books of sorcery, rich craft, and they have a book burning in the middle of the city and the church is planted. Well, what's the point? What are you saying? So why did Jesus forbid Paul in going to Asia first? You know why I think so? It's because even though it was part of the plan, the timing was off, and the Lord was still materializing things in Asia. He was still materializing things in Ephesus behind the scenes. And if Paul would have went there earlier, it wouldn't have had the effect as it did when he went all the way around the back door and came in later. Sometimes... Rejection is God's way of redirecting your life so that it will be 10 times more fruitful than what it had been if you just plowed through and battled through and just kept going where you thought you were supposed to be going. What are you saying? I'm saying these are ways we handle rejection. These are ways we process rejection. We look at it as building stones for our faith and we look at it as protection, that he's actually protecting us, that the Lord is actually protecting you even a good thing can carry you off the path. Even a good opportunity can carry you off the path. But if we are led by him, he will lead and guide every one of our steps. Man, I don't know about you guys. I just want to encourage you. You may have a door closed right now. There may be something that just will not open job-wise, house-wise. It's been a fight. It's been a battle. I want to encourage you. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. Don't interpret that as he's rejecting you, but that he's actually providing something better for you. He's actually opening up a better way for you. Last one, we'll end here. Jesus uses rejection as a means to refocus on what's important. Jesus uses rejection as a means to refocus on what's important. You know, the Lord was well acquainted with rejection mentally, physically, spiritually, but Check out these few verses. I found a common thread. I'll go through them quickly. Mark 6.6, 6, after his hometown in Nazareth that turned him away and rejected him, Jesus goes on to say this, and he went out among the next villages teaching. Luke 9.56, after the Samaritans refused to host Jesus and his disciples, you remember that? His disciples wanted to call down fire on them. Like, what are y'all doing? We want to see them burn. It's like, no, that's not the way. And he said, they went on to another village. How about Peter, James, and John in Matthew 26, 46, when they fall asleep in the garden of Gethsemane? Jesus, who had asked them to remain awake, says, hey, rise up. Let's go. Let's be on the go. And when Judas betrays him, Jesus responds in Matthew 26, 50. He says to Judas, do whatever you did. Do whatever you came to do. Do you see a common thread in those? I do. What I see is that Jesus is rejected in every one of those. But how does he respond? He goes to the next step. You see, when we're rejected, we can defend ourselves or we can get stuck and just sit there. But Jesus, in all these points where he was rejected, he didn't defend. He didn't argue his point. He wiped his feet and he just went to the next town, to the next village, to the next person, to the next home, to the next person so on and so on and so on. What a beautiful way for you and I to handle rejection in our life. 
that we could actually use it to refocus on what's really important in our life. And that is we just keep going one step at a time, one person at a time, one decision at a time. And instead of just staying stuck in the mud or stuck in the rejection or stuck in the, the pain and, and all of those things, there's a, there's a process. Jesus moved forward in rejection. And I just think that, I think, guys, that is just so awesome that that is worth, that is worth noting, man. That, that rejection is actually used to refocus our attention back on him. Isn't that good news? So I want to encourage us today to process rejection well. All right, let's end here. I want to just give six quick tools that will help you, help you with processing rejection practically. Number one, accept it. If you're rejected, accept it. Recognize it. Don't run from it. Don't shy away from it. Don't ruminate. Embrace it and acknowledge for what it is. The second one, refocus your identity on Christ. Refocus your identity on Jesus. Revisit your core memories with him. Revisit your foundational stones. Revisit the foundational blocks that he has set in your life. Third one, strengthen your relationships. This is a great way to process rejection. Strengthen your relationships. Surround, your pe surround yourself with people who love you and who encourage you. And for place boundaries, healthy boundaries on those who constantly reject you or continually reject you. You want to put healthy boundaries in place, right? The other one is forgiveness. We know that's a given. Forgiveness actually gives hope for God to redeem the situation of rejection. And the last one, gratitude. Man, I have found what a tool. The more that we are grateful and we just focus on what we do have and where we are, even in the midst of rejection, there's something about it just shifts the focus uh, in a healthy way that we trust him to work through that process of being rejected. Blessed are those who are rejected. Blessed are those who are persecuted. For righteousness sake, for I will give them the whole of the kingdom of heaven. Great is their reward. I want to remind us this morning, Great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward when you are able to process rejection with the Lord and you trust him and you walk forward. Amen. Can you guys stand with me? Worship team, can you come on up? If you guys can just begin playing. I felt like this morning, there's some of us that are just carrying these bags when we got some stones that, that we just need to give to the Lord, that it's time to return to the Lord. And so I want to encourage us this morning that whatever you may be carrying, whatever has been hurled at you, whatever that has been thrown at you, Whatever thing that you have been really battling, no one knows internally, but it's really robbed rest. It's robbed peace. I just want to let you know you don't have to carry it. You don't have to carry it anymore. You can let it go. And you can literally turn it over to the Lord. And I promise you, his presence will begin to help you process and turn what was meant to hurt you and to harm you into actually a way that blesses your life. Brings you into deeper fellowship with him. Secures your faith. Secures our future. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you this morning. Come and do only what you can do. Remove every weight. Remove every boulder. 
every brick, every weighty thing that we are not intended to carry. Holy Spirit, would you begin to release that right now? Would you begin to undo the backpacks of us that are carrying backpacks? Would you just begin to undo the burdens and undo the heaviness and the yokes that maybe have been placed on us or maybe that we had to embrace along the way? Whatever it is, I just feel like, guys, we are in a moment, we are in a time and a season where the Lord is removing things. He's making us lighter. He's preparing us because he wants to fill this space. He wants to fill you and I with more of who he is. And this is why he's removing things. This is why he's undoing things. This is why he's unstrapping things. This is why he's releasing things. It's because he's preparing himself a room. He's preparing himself a dwelling place. He's preparing himself a temple, a sanctuary. He's preparing for himself a place that he could call home. Whew. And so right now, this morning, if you're here, and there is like, you, you want room in your heart for the Lord. And there's some things he's removing. There's some things that he needs to remove or he wants to remove. I want you to come forward. And can we worship? Jay, can we worship? There's something about when we worship, when we worship him, when we, when we exalt him and we adore him, these things roll off. Again, it's nothing we have to do. It's just putting our gaze on him and worshiping him. So if that's you, and I know there are some folks in this room that are carrying some things, I want you to come on down. I want you to join with me. Join with us, and let's just begin to worship him and let him undo these backpacks. Let's go ahead and worship for a minute. Thank you. I'm caught up in your I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy moment Never want to worship him. Tell him how you feel. Invite him into your life right now. Welcome him into your heart. Welcome him into that experience. He's here to heal you. He's here to love you this morning. Lord, we trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Father.
I just keep seeing this picture right now of the Lord. Just, I see some of you this morning, this is what I feel like the Lord was showing me, as I could actually see your backs, and I just see where your backs have just been scarred, and just wounds and cuts all in the back from different arrows and, and words from the enemy, things that have just hurt and wounded you in this last season. I just see so much of that. But I kept seeing the Lord this morning in here, and he had this, uh, it's like a cotton ball, big cotton ball, and it was oily and this ointment, and he was just, he was dapping it on the wounds and the cuts. And I just saw the Lord healing wounds this morning. I saw him healing those things that have been hurtful, that we've carried, that we've absorbed. I just saw the Lord healing, bringing incredible healing, healing to your heart, healing to your past, healing to your present. I just saw the Lord in this place bringing incredible healing in your soul. I saw him literally taking pain out. I saw him extracting the pain out of it. I saw him pulling the pain out of the memory and out of the experiences. And I just saw this healing balm, this healing oil being poured out, this healing oil being poured out over your life and over your family and over your heart. I just saw the Lord pouring oil and pouring it out and pouring it out and pouring it out. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Pour out your healing oil. Pour out your healing balm. Heal every wound. Bind up every disease. Heal every sickness. Heal every wound in this place. Release your healing. Release your healing. Release your healing. Every weight be gone. Every brick be gone. Every stone be gone. Every weight be gone. Every illegal burden be gone. Every heaviness be gone. We worship you. We exalt you. We welcome you. You are the king. You are the Lord. You are Jehovah. You are Jireh. You are the one. You are the cornerstone. You are the elder, the shepherd. You are the good shepherd that lays his life down for the sheep. We love you. We bless you. Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out, Lord. Pour out your rain. Pour out your spirit. Pour out your fire. Pour out your oil. Pour out your life. Pour out your presence. I just feel some of you got to release a sound right here. There's a shout in you. There's a sound in you that has not been released. I want to give you permission to open your mouth and to release your sound and to release your cry and to release your joy right now. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We glorify you. Shout unto the earth. Sing praises to his name. Cry out to the Lord. The rocks will not be, the rocks will not cry out on my behalf. The rocks will not cry out on my behalf. Woo! Unlock us, unlock us, unlock us, unlock us, unlock us. Break every chain, break every shackle, break every chain, break every shackle. Freedom. No more. No more chains. No more chains. No more bondage.
thank you, Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love and your presence in this place. We thank you for the lightness of your yoke. Your burden is easy and your yoke is light. Woo, we rest in you, Jesus. We rest in you, Lord. Now lead us. Show us the next step, Lord. Show us the next step. Lead our lives this week. Go before us and shine your light on the path you want us to take. I pray, Lord, right now that if there's anyone in this room online who is struggling to fit in wherever they are, Lord, let that word just resonate so deep in their spirit that you call them to be set apart and to stand out. Lord, I thank you that you choose peculiar people and that you choose the unlikely, the unqualified, the undignified. I thank you that you take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, that you take things that are not to make things that are, and that you take pleasure, that you take pleasure in restoring the broken heart. You take pleasure in restoring the man who is at his wit's end, the woman who's walked away from her family, the child who's contemplating killing themselves. Lord, that you love the brokenhearted and that you love the weary. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you're removing idols, that you're removing distractions, that you are preparing room for you to dwell. We agree with your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a shout this morning. Amen. Nah, can we like give him a shout? Like this is Jesus. Come on. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. A uh, few quick things before we break this afternoon. Um, Oh, I just feel the Lord so strong, it's hard to make announcements. As we leave, I do want prayer servants, if we could hang at the altar. And if you need prayer for anything, we'd love for you to get prayer for them before you leave. If you guys can make your way up here at the altar, be available, be present. And if you need any prayer of anything, I would encourage you to see these guys and get prayer before you leave today. Uh, the other thing is, I want to remind us, um, ties and offerings. Ties and offerings. We have offerings in this basket that you can give by check or you can go on our website, gardengreenville.com and you can give online that way. You're sowing into good ground, I promise you. Lastly is we have a connections desk here. Um, somebody will share information if you're new to the church and have some information. And Refire is going to meet, is that right, Miss Helen? In Audby. Did I get it? Okay. Awesome. I'll be for refire. Awesome. Guys, be blessed. Have a great week. Hug somebody on your way out. Love on them. Pray for them. Encourage them.